Podri Tang for joining us. Now, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Yoko Suga, and my, my name is Toshifumi Takada. We are faculties of the National Chuncha University. We are the moderators for today. Everyone, and Honorable Minister Audrey Tan, thank you for participating in this event of Q&A session titled Digital Social Innovation. As we announced to all of the participants, we will conduct this with questions and answers. The participants can upload the questions to an app called Slide, and Ms. Audrey will choose questions to answer. We have already collected around 30 questions and uploaded them to Slido. You can upload your question now from your smartphone or iPad or PC. Well, let's get started. Welcome, Minister Audrey Tan. Hello, good local time, everyone. I already saw the 30 questions and I invite you uh, to vote uh, on those questions so that I know which question has the most number of people wanting me to answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And please uh, show the slide. <laughs> yeah. Show you the image. Is this something that you want me to do? Oh, okay. Here are the Slido questions. The latest question yes. will appear on the bottom and the top questions appear well on the top. Okay, the first <laughs> question is, yeah, 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 from Mimi. <laughs> So the first question asks, many people are fooled by the information on the internet. Do you think children need a special education that fosters the mind's eye to distinguish the real thing? I believe that education is called media competence. In the old days, the journalists learn about media competence because they are the gatekeepers of the real thing. However, nowadays, everyone is potentially a media person. Any student can start a live stream, a podcast, uh, or distribute a short video on the internet without any gatekeepers uh, to watch over them. So because everyone is a media producer now, everyone also need to learn about fact checking, about balancing the different views, about checking two sources before you publish anything, and many other things that the journalists um, learn as part of their education. So in Taiwan, we offer media competence, not just literacy. Literacy is when you are a reader or a viewer. Competence is when you are a producer, classes um, in the basic education. So they can, for example, fact check the presidential candidates, debates, and speeches. Or, for example, that people can measure their own air quality to corroborate on the ideas uh, that stems out from where the pollution comes from. Was it from overseas or from mobile or from immobile places and so on? They get to discover the real thing themselves as a group assignment, as a community, instead of just take one single source as granted. Thank you so much. So, um, do I simply go to the next question then? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Um, Nimi san also said electricity is indispensable for digital technology. Uh, do you think Taiwan, Japan, or other nuclear um, countries need a nuclear power plant? Well, the Taiwanese people uh, have recently went through a national referendum 
Uh, and there's likely more people that says we don't want the forced nuclear plant, uh, maybe because we are in a place with a lot of earthquakes and so on, compared to the people who say, nevertheless, we trust the safety and so on. But it was pretty close uh, in Taiwan. I don't know the situation at the moment uh, in Japan. Um, personally, I believe uh, that we should also pay more attention on energy uh, battery devices, like an internet of batteries, uh, who can, for example, for new renewable resources like solar panel, instead of just using it at the moment, store it so that during the night when the demand is higher, we can actually gather those batteries, maybe small ones like the recharging uh, dock of the Gogoro uh, electric scooter. scooter. The scooter's um, charging station also serves as a virtual power plant uh, that people can actually get and draw energy from. So energy storage and the networking democratization of the virtualized power plants, I think, is also important and I think less controversial, uh, less likely to be a, a national referendum topic compared to nuclear power plants plants. Um, the next question uh, from CCU asks, what digital capabilities should Taiwanese students develop before they enter the job market to meet the needs of the industry's needs in the next decade? I think continuous learning uh, is the most important capability over the internet because over the internet is far easier to be autonomous, to settle not just on a problem, but a project or a purpose and learn everything related to that purpose. So PBL uh, become purpose-based learning because internet communities are often formed by a shared purpose. Now this autonomous purpose leads to interactions. So interacting with people people online, the art of uh, talking transculturally, of respecting each other's cultures, even in different time zones and so on, that's equally important. And finally, the common good, finding the common points, the good enough consensus, the values that we can live with, despite our different cultures, different positions and so on, is also important. So autonomy, interaction and the common good, I think are the three capabilities that everyone should have in the digital area. So Yutaka Onishi-san uh, would like to ask, have you ever thought the digital divide could be a hindrance when you make or pursue your government policy? And how have you tackled the hindrance? I believe uh, in the principle of nothing about some people without those people's participation, nothing about us without us. So instead of saying uh, we design for the elderly people, we need to design with the elderly people, instead of saying we design for the parents uh, who want to, um, you know, take care of their child while operating uh, with one hand on the mobile phone, the digital services, we need to design with them because they are closest to the pain. We need to empower them. And so we have designed many digital services that doesn't look very efficient uh, on the first side. For example, uh, still the easiest way to get uh, your vaccination certificate or to reserve for your vaccination or uh, uh, to uh, pre-order masks and so on has been in the past couple of years taking your IC card to a nearby convenience store and use the kiosk there or to go and uh, a pharmacy and talk to the pharmacists. Now, everyone would say, um, but a mobile app, shouldn't that be more efficient? But the problem is if we use the mobile app first, then it's unfair to people, more than 20% of people who've never installed an app on their mobile phone or they don't own a mobile phone. So we always design with the elders um, need in mind and choose choose the way of uh, preference, like use their IC card of healthcare instead of IC card of debit card, because they feel safer uh, using the health card because they know they wouldn't mistype a password and uh, accidentally wire out their savings and so on. The risk uh, is lower for scans and so on. And once we uh, work with those elderly people to get the service out, then we start to work with
with the younger people to say, okay, here are the API, are the shared machine to machine points. Uh, feel free to fork to make new alternative of our re initial reference implementation and make sure that uh, it also works better for your purpose, like through a chatbot, uh, through virtual reality, through a map, whatever. That's all fine, but we always start with a trustworthy IC card in a nearby pharmacy or in a nearby convenience store where the staff can help you. So, um, shall we go on? When, uh, oh, new questions are rising to the top. Um, do you think that the Japanese shrine, uh, Shensha, Jinja, or other sacred areas should coexist with the digital society, or should they be kept separate? Um, I believe in Taiwan, we have 20 national languages, including the sign language, 16 of which are indigenous. So they all have their different cultures with very overlapping areas and jurisdictions and so on. Uh, and so to design a digital society is to co-create transculturally. In Taiwanese Mandarin, shu wei means both digital and plural, like shu shi wei, shu bai wei, right? So the digital society is a plural society, and it's only when the norms of each culture is supported, not disrupted by the digital services, can people see the merit of using digital technologies. So there are many very advanced designs, but the ones that will take code in any particular culture need to come from the grassroots, from that particular culture. It may also be digital, but at least it's driven by the people well within that culture instead of across a different culture of progress. Hope that answered the question. Um, the Mimi-san also asks, when developing digital technology for democracy, could the power of authority, for example, copyright, be enhanced or weakened? Um, I believe that people should have the right to donate their intellectual work into the commons for people to use freely. Now, many academic people already allows anyone to copy their paper as long as they are properly attributed. This is called open access. Now, people who practice law or in the public service, many of those uh, cases, judgments, laws, and regulation, those are not even copyrightable, uh, and you cannot uh, demand attribution and so on. Um, in other uh, industries, such as fashion, in many jurisdictions, the color, the composition of each uh, design piece of the uh, clothes, these are not copyrightable. And so the fashion industry moves very quickly because nobody can profit off a um, design that they did three quarters ago. Everybody is already copying it, right? So in many different fields, when the norm is for open innovation, we see faster iteration, faster agile collaboration. In other areas, maybe it's not copyright, but patents, trade secrets, or semiconductor layouts, and so on. So each area has have a different norm. And again, we should not disrupt a norm over here saying, oh, because I'm a open source advocate, I demand open hardware from TSMC. I don't do that. But I make sure that the benefit that we gain from the open access and open innovation model is well understood so that, for example, if the semiconductor company discover that their energy saving algorithm through machine learning is better open sourced, uh, they know which community to contact. All right, um, we'll go on then. So uh, another question uh, is from um, here, uh, Toshifumi Takada-san, uh, who asks, IT is widely used in our life. This is called the IoT or Internet of Things. Now, IoT is said to have a security hole or many. What do you think about how to secure the safety of the IoT? This is an excellent question. Now. Uh, Internet of Things um, is many things. For example, your phone is a IoT device, is a thing that's connected to the Internet. Uh, my eyeglass at the moment is not an IoT because it does not connect to the Internet. But if I want to start uh, video conferencing in my eyeglass, I will switch to an IoT eyeglass uh, so that I can join uh, augmented reality. So 
to secure IoT, what happens is we need to have good practices like washing one's hands, uh, wearing masks and so on protects against the biological virus. So does the use of uh, two-factor authentication of end-to-end -end encryption, keeping your software update uh, and things like that. Good habits secure your phone and the related IoT devices. Just like the uh, public health um, advices may sound very simple, very mundane, like wash your hands thoroughly, uh, it's actually hard to do that unless people around you make it a habit to do that together. So while it makes a lot of sense to simply say, oh, uh, keep two backups in different places, um, and in addition to whatever devices you're holding, so that if ransomware or some other things hits you, you can very quickly restore the resilience and uh, just practice uh, all the time. Now, this is something as simple as running a backup, like washing your hands thoroughly, but reminding each other to do that over time uh, will really increase uh, the compliance rate within your organization, especially if the leadership start doing that first, uh, setting a example. So securing IoT devices begins with good habits and then listening uh, to the actual frontline people to discover which part of the security habits make their life harder. For example, typing a password with exclamation marks and punctuation and things like that, and then switch uh, to a zero trust password list and different kind of authentication to make authentication an easier habit uh, to work with. In Taiwan, uh, we have many designs uh, for that. We have um, the FIDO compliant uh, digital citizen certificate. Nowadays, I don't even use a plastic card anymore. I simply use the biometric uh, in my uh, phone, but I don't transmit my biometric to other places. And that serves as a authentication device to many of the services and so on. So I believe we really need to join together into an internet of beings and practice good uh, health habits uh, on the cybersecurity front. Hope that answered the question. So um, should I simply move on, right? I don't have to wait for a translation or anything. Okay. Um, another question from Mimi. Fast could be an important key to digital democracy, but when dealing directly with human lives, for example, vaccination, does not fast sometime increase the risk? Uh, that's an excellent question. Now, fast in my uh, idea, means a very quick access to what's actually happening. It means a collective intelligence with high bandwidth, low latency access to the facts. So it doesn't mean that we very quickly force people to do things, but it does mean that everyone see the factual data in real time. Um, many people understand that the mask uh, rationing scheme in Taiwan two years ago relies on people understanding the real-time inventory of masks in each of the pharmacies refreshed every 30 seconds, something we also are doing with rapid antigen uh, tests at this moment. But um, at the time of vaccination, since you ask about it, what's equally important is we publish how many people are willing to get the AstraZeneca AZ shots um, generously donated by Japan. Uh, and also later on the Moderna shots, the homebrew Medigen shots, and then later on the Pfizer BNT shots. Now we publish, for example, the <coughs> elderly <coughs> are hesitant uh, in getting the AZ shots uh, last April and May. Uh, starting July, we simply uh, dial down the age bracket. So every week we will say, okay, because not many elderly people want to get AZ, now it's the turn for 50 years old, for 40 years old, for 35 years old, for 27 years old, and so on. And that has two effects. First, it makes the conspiracy theories about vaccines, not against vaccine in general, but just Moderna better than AZ or BNT, better than Medigen or something like that. So people don't refuse vaccination outright, but they still, their preference of vaccination are still respected. Uh, and the second thing is the elderly people discover, well, their younger um, friends, they are all getting AstraZeneca and 
they, they seem just fine, right? So by rolling out the vaccination as quickly as they land to our airports, we very quickly vaccinated a lot of people. Our booster shot uh, earlier this year is, uh, I think, the fastest um, track uh, in the entire world. So it dispels a lot of rumors about side effects and so on and ends up uh, getting more people willing to get vaccinated, uh, even though they still have preferences on specific vaccination uh, labels and types. But pretty much no one is against vaccination as a principle compared to many other jurisdictions. Hope that answered the question. So fast is about information sharing. It's not about forcing people to get AstraZeneca. Uh, Mimi uh, asks, sometimes I would like to avoid all the signals, but it is difficult, it is hard to escape the signals in the digitally developed city. In such a case, should I go to the mountain? I regret to inform you, even on the highest mountain, almost 4,000 meters high in Taiwan, Yushan, you still have broadband connection. So you cannot uh, escape broadband connection simply by going to a mountain. Uh, but you can do what I do. Uh, I don't interface with a touch screen directly. I always interface with the screen through a stylus. So I write uh, on my pad here, but I don't touch its screen. For my phone also, it has a stylus. For my computer, of course, keyboard or touchpad or mouse. So by going through an intermediary, it increased the intention, the intent of interaction. You need to think which part of the screen you want to interact with before interacting with it. And you will not be mindlessly swiping uh, the feeds uh, from social media or some other places. Uh, if you try to swipe all the time with a stylus, you will find it's very uh, difficult, actually. So uh, by making sure that we interact with the devices with intent, it means that we uh, retain the agency, we initiate the interaction. It is not the addictive behavior of the touch screen initiating this. So that is the boundary of my body. And I also have the boundary of my time. Uh, every 30 minutes, I take a five minutes break. That's called the Pomodoro method. So during the five minutes break, I will stay away from the screen or I will switch to a different screen, but I will break the habit of manufactured addiction. Hope that answered your question. Um, two people would like to know, what is your view on Web3? Is it possible for you to conduct any application in the government? If yes, what's the advantage? And if not, why? So just last week, uh, Vitalik Buterin and a few of my friends, uh, we are all um, on the board of Radical Exchange, uh, Vitalik published a paper called DSOC, Decentralized Society. Um, I also contributed, if you see a quote from Dao De Jing, uh, that's my first contribution. Uh, but anyway, the DSOC paper talks about Web 3.0 as a place not just for decentralized finance with wallets and not just uh, for payments and investments, but actually for holding credentials, for holding the proof of participation. It could be, for example, hosting the proof that we all attended this virtual conference together. And unlike traditional NFTs, which always goes to a highest bidder, it doesn't make sense to sell this proof of participation. Just like if someone uh, climbed uh, the Mount uh, Everest or Yushan, or if someone won an Olympic medal uh, in the Tokyo Olympics, uh, what matters is the proof of their participation. And all the participants agree that this person won gold, that person won silver, that person won bronze. It doesn't make sense if you simply auction off your gold medal to somebody else and then somebody else become an Olympic champion, right? So it needs to have a way for the community to exist on Web3 in a way that conforms to the norms about community that we already recognize with each other in the uh, real world, right? So once Web3 has these ideas of communities, of uh, identity that are intersection of communities, of credential that doesn't go to the highest bidder, that are non-transferable, uh, we call them cell-bound tokens and so on, then it has real application in government because we also want to provide service 
to the people overseas who want to interact with people in Taiwan or with the Taiwanese governmental services, but they've never been to Taiwan. In Estonia, they hand out e-residency cards that people can become an e-resident and even open a company in Estonia without even stepping into Estonia, right? But if many jurisdictions develop that sort of things by themselves, we cannot cross-recognize the Estonian e-residency with the Taiwanese gold card with many, many different designs. Uh, but on Web3, if it has soulbound tokens and decentralized society, then all these different communities can work across different jurisdictions, just like the domain name system works across jurisdictions. Even if you're in Estonia, typing something dot tw goes to my computer, right? So that is the kind of internet working that powered the web one, the web two, and we're now upgrading it so it can power communities in the web three space. So I hope that answered the question. Now, uh, more uh, high votes. Um, Toshifumi Takata-san would like to know, you are belonging to the government as IT minister. I'm the digital minister. IT connects machines, digital connects people, different things. I'm the digital minister. What is an important role of the government in such an emergency incident such as COVID-19? I think the government needs to work with the people and empower people closest to the pain. People who want, for example, to know very quickly where to get rapid antigen, to get the medical grade mask, to get vaccinated, to prove that they have been vaccinated, and so on, need to access this without the government in the middle. So, as I said, they can take their own IC card, their health card, to a nearby convenience store and simply book vaccination or print out the certificates and things like that. And that is the um, service delivered closest to the people. If they need other people helping them, it may be the local pharmacists, it may be the local um, community workers and so on, instead of saying everyone should just go to the health burial, uh, which are frankly speaking uh, overwhelmed with all sorts of different counter COVID situations, we need to empower the communities and their leaders to provide such services in a decentralized but still trustworthy way. I think this empowerment of community is part of the Taiwan model that led us very successfully counter the pandemic without a single day of lockdowns. Um, so do I move on to other questions? Um, let's see. So Eldon would like to know, good afternoon. What do you think are the pros and cons of Taiwan's IT policies and practices uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the China, the US and the UK? Now, it's very difficult to compare when you're running on opposite tracks. Right, because as I said, the Taiwan model is about zero lockdown. But as everybody knows, the model in the PRC is all about lockdown. They do believe that only in a lockdown situation can the state manage the um, transmissibility of the virus. And they did have a lot of success starting from the Wuhan case and so on throughout the different mutations of the virus. So the original variant, the alpha variant, the delta variant are all countered to some degree by the lockdown uh, strategy in the PRC. But if we uh, say that Taiwan, how does it compare? It doesn't compare because from the very beginning, because we remember the SARS lockdown of the Herping Hospital in 2003, we, we just don't want to go there. So we went through a very different route where people take the agency, protect one another, wearing masks, washing hands, keeping social distance, contact tracing, and all these stuff. So I do not actually think it is comparable. Uh, but now uh, that Omicron variant um, happens uh, to the PRC, uh, the lockdown strategy are also under the stress test of the Omicron variant, and we don't know how many Greek alphabets uh, will <laughs> happen after Omicron. Uh, the virus just keep mutating. So I don't know whether I can make a direct comparison, but I can say that the Taiwan model is about zero lockdown while minimizing the casualties. All right. So um, again, uh, Toshi Fumi Takada-san would like to know, 
what does IT do to help aging people? I am thinking of an uh, idea of an alert system for a single aged people. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, assistive intelligence or AI systems uh, that, for example, when you fall down uh, or uh, when you um, accidentally lost something or things like that, it helps the uh, aged people to uh, regain some sort of uh, cognitive control uh, over their environment. Uh, I do believe these are very important. It would be just like uh, wearing eyeglasses because it's serves the best interest of one person and also uh, is aligned uh, with their best interest in an accountable way. Uh, but also, I think IT uh, or digital connection can help to help us. It can help the social workers and the workers that take care of the aging people to understand better, for example, uh, how these people are expressing their needs. Many of them uh, do not speak in a perfect language for uh, Siri to understand what they are talking, right? In Taiwan, as I mentioned, there are 20 different national languages. Many elderly people prefer to converse uh, in their familiar language, which may not be Mandarin, actually mostly not Mandarin, right? So all these um, needs uh, are uh, our um, priority to work with the Ministry of Culture, the Indigenous um, Council, and many uh, of other ministries to ensure that they can converse with the digital services through the help us, even though they may not uh, share the same Mandarin or English uh, capabilities um, as uh, is the mainstream AI, right? So the diversity, the cultural significance of the sensitivity uh, to the needs of the elderly people are also something that our assistive intelligence can help on. So I hope that answered the question. Um, Toshifumi Takada-san would like to know, I watched a TV program showing that a robot can be used for such a single person's house. What do you think about this? Well, the entire house could be a robot, right? Uh, like uh, what we are uh, talking about a, a car that's autonomous. It doesn't mean that the car makes decisions without informing you. It means that the car is able to converse with you, to inform you of uh, where it's going, uh, what's your priority, what's your preferences, like a personal assistant. So personal service, personalized service is about aligning to that person's best interest. It's not about making decisions without informing that person. So the single person's house or indeed a, a house in general, I think just like smart cities should cater to the smart citizens, making citizens smarter. So should a smart house or a smart habitat make the person living in it smarter instead of making decisions for them without informing them. Hope that answered the question. Now, the very next question. Automobile companies are also developing an auto-driving car. AI is needed for such cars. What do you think about AI? Does it replace the work of human beings? We already have auto-driving cars for many decades now since I was a child, but it goes vertically. When I was a child, an elevator is called a car. Uh, still in some of the older buildings, uh, it says car one, car two, or car three, or something. Because at the time, that vertical car was operated by a elevator operator, like a driver, uh, who need to inform where the elevator is going. But that was when I was really, really young. <laughs> Uh, when I grow up a little bit, all those vertical cars became self-driving. And then we stopped calling them cars. We call them elevators or escalators uh, or things like that. Now, something similar is happening in the metro lines. It used to be that each metro car need to still have a driver uh, that controls the car whenever there's something that's an emergency. But nowadays, a single driver driving remotely an entire assembly of all the different lines of a metro is already in place in Taiwan, I'm sure, in Japan as well. So again, the metro cars are fully autonomous now, but it doesn't mean that there's no driver. It just means the driver is not on the car. The driver is still taking care of the emergency uh, situations to ensure resilience and so on. So when the more and more lanes, like the vertical lane of elevator, uh, uh, the fixed tracks of a metro uh, or the dedicated tracks of a light rail and so on. When the social norm around such rails are defined um, to such a degree that we always know uh, how to hold them accountable. 
and how aligned are they to our best interest, then autonomous uh, cars will take place and maybe we stop calling them cars. Uh, when the autonomous trucks on a highway in a dedicated lane forming a fleet become part of our everyday uh, work, maybe we call them software defined rail or something like that, right? So uh, the idea of a driver and a car are under continuous integration and evolution as soon as we have a track for it that we can prove the alignment accountability. Maybe it's stop being a car. I hope that answered the question. So uh, Mimi said, once a nuclear weapon is dropped, any society will end. Do you think that if each of us know the facts of the world using digital technology, we can avoid nuclear weapons? Um, of course, that is very important that we understand the um, consequence of nuclear weapons. But uh, the internet was actually designed to survive a nuclear war. That's the original design specification of internet. It's when all the um, direct communication lines, all the radios and all the modes of communication, as we know it, the telecom operator are nuked. Uh, the remaining communication need to take place in whichever connectivity lines that are not broken. So it gives internet its characteristics of resilience of whenever a route is broken, maybe it's bombed, then it just go to some other route, right? Um, or not a route, but through a low uh, Earth orbit uh, satellite, as we have seen in Ukraine, uh, and things like that, right? So it just go whichever way. So uh, that is why internet adoption always increase sharply after a earthquake, a typhoon, or indeed a geopolitical war or things like that, because it's designed in such disaster and disaster recovery scenarios. Now, I'm not saying that uh, nuclear wars can be uh, entirely um, recovered by the use of the internet. I'm definitely not saying that. But I'm saying that once we all understand how to configure internet, even on an interplanetary fashion, then we can actually um, make our risk lower uh, if we don't just live in one cradle of civilization, which is the Earth, but rather other planets, um, exoplanets, and so on, which makes it harder to nuke uh, the entire uh, galaxy, and so on. Um, CCU would like to know, as an interdepartmental minister, when dealing with urgent cases with no consensus, how do you approach the situation in terms of strategies and attitude? There is always consensus. It's just whether you want the fine consensus where everybody can sign the contract, or you just want the good enough consensus, the consent, where people say, ah, we can live with it. So you can always get some sort of consensus if you work on the first principles and values, case in point. Um, in Taiwan, uh, we had national referendum on many things. Uh, for example, one is about marriage equality. There are roughly half of the population feeling very strongly that their family to family kinship relationship is part of the tradition and the same sex uh, marriage should not disrupt this family relationship, this lineage. On the other hand, there are other half of population believing very strongly that uh, just because I'm born, uh, my biology is such a way, it should not restrict my human rights of being wed to another individual regardless of their biology. Biology should not determine our destiny and our rights. And so these two people, although it seems like there's no consensus, there are a good enough consent in that both believe that um, a marriage <clears throat> makes sense and marriage is a good thing for uh, a, a long-lasting bond to hold. So if you abstract away this, this becomes the common point that they can then talk about. So after the constitutional court ruling and two referenda, we decided that the uh, bylaws are important, the rights and duties are important, so we legalized that. But the kinship, the family relationship, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, that should not be disrupted, so we do not change the civil code. As a result, by legalizing the bylaws and not the in-laws, well, both sides think, yeah, it's not perfect, but we can live with it. And so both sides uh, feel 
that this kind of situation has progressed despite they initially holding very different positions. So finding a common ground, a common good, I believe is the most important skill, um, not just an interdepartmental minister, but really as anyone facilitating a positive some conversation. So, <clears throat> Stacey, you would like to not a question, but rather uh, express gratitude for the speedy upgrade of Taiwanese digital infrastructure during the epidemic. Thank you. Indeed, just today, we just announced uh, that starting next Wednesday, uh, anyone who want a proof, a certificate uh, of their uh, quarantine or isolation as a contact um, can simply print it out at the nearby 7-Eleven or Family Port or any convenience store through the digital uh, certificate, the DVC website. So they do not have to line up or call the health ministries and bureaus anymore. And that is by popular demand. We simply reuse the system that we designed for uh, pre-registering the masks and uh, things like that in a convenience store to facilitate this kind of uh, infrastructure. So it's not just public infrastructure, it's also reusing the part of participating private sector infrastructure, in this case, the kiosks in the four different convenience store chains. Um, CC, you would like to know why was the online vaccination reservation system cancelled? It was sometimes overwhelmed, but it was at least a centralized systematic reservation platform. Um, so it was not cancelled. It was on pause before the booster shot. It was reopened for the booster shot, and then it was closed again. And the reason why it was closed again was that we've well reached the critical mass uh, of the booster shots so that we can switch uh, to live with the virus. And also because when not enough people show up when they make a reservation, it makes the livelihood of the public health people in municipalities very difficult. So um, the participating municipalities need to dedicate a certain amount of personnel to keep the reservation system running. And we discovered that only when people have a high willingness to get their shots, first the first and second, and now the booster, in a very short time frame, does it make sense to open the Y92 to online vaccine reservation system? Otherwise, you know, we are at the mercy of the local municipalities. If they do not dedicate any vaccination clinics and so on to the Y92 system, there's very little that we can do to force them to open up vaccination uh, slots. So always, um, it's also by consensus of all the participating more than 20 municipalities and counties uh, to open the 1922. So if uh, time goes on and we um, need the fourth shot and so on, and when the critical mass of the participating municipalities and counties say, okay, let's open 1922 again, well, the system is still there and we will then reboot it. Hope that answered the question. So, um, to Shifumi Takada-san, we'd like to know, and to destroy atomic power plants in Fukushima, many robots are being used for checking the inside. What do you think about the future of the robots? Well, I think the robots are here to assist us. They are not here to authorize over us. So the human beings connect to each other better because we dedicate more time to fellow human beings and while the robots take care of the assistive work. But the robots are here to facilitate more human-to-human -human communication, not substitute for human-for-human -human communication. So I would not say, um, let's just talk to robots. I will let my robot talk to your robot. No, uh, the robots and the machine learning assistants are there so that, for example, we can communicate across language barriers, cultural barriers, time zone barriers, and also of different barriers and feel that we are in the same place uh, through the robotic avatars, uh, through co-presence and so on. But at the end of the day, digital is about connecting people to people, not about connecting machine to machines or just people to machines. Um, Yutaka Onishi-san said, what do you think the most difficult field to transfer analog uh, to digital? What cannot be digitalized? That is an excellent question. Um, I would say that it's not about replacing analog to digital. It's about assisting analog with digital. So digital technology needs to work with the people, 
to work for the society, not disrupting the society so that we transfer analog to digital. I'm not uh, about that because if we say, oh, the analog part doesn't count, the aluminum part, let's just drop it. Let's just go fully bodiless and paperless. Then uh, very precious things, uh, the uh, habitat of oral history, of people spending their time together in a community, all those just disappears. But the digital is not here to make those things disappear. It's to make the realities shared across different analog uh, places, which is why I always say shared reality instead of virtual reality and always collaborative learning instead of just machine learning. So I think all transfers are difficult. We should not transfer analog to digital. We should augment and assist the analog with digital. So, um, PR, please talk about, CCU asks, your approach to defining and solving problems through the combination of digital tools and scenario analysis, for example, on pandemic control. Uh, that's a very good question. Now, I think it's not me who solved the problems. I'm like an amplifier of solutions. I will see all the civic technologies already forking the digital services, people would make interactive line bots um, to find the rapid antigens, or people would make their own personal assistance um, to get the vaccination reservation before we roll out the 1922. People will make their own analysis on mass distribution before we switch to pre-registration. So I'm not working for the people, I'm working with the people and discovering the people closest to the pain, discovering the innovators among those, and then amplify their reach so that their innovation become national wide innovations within 24 hours. So this is not scenario analysis by my own ingenuity, but relying on the collective intelligence of anyone who call 1922 to uh, talk to our call center people with their invention. And I can then turn those inventions into real-time uh, collaborations with people who don't have to travel to our capital city, actually. Uh, the mask uh, distribution map people uh, stay in the Tainan uh, the entire time, and we just worked on the digital collaborative spaces like the Gov Zero Slack and so on to turn their local innovations into national ones. Um, a person asked, as the digital minister, what are the implications for Taiwan from the Ukraine war? What are the advantage and disadvantage of Taiwan comparing with Ukraine? Now, I'm not the defense minister, uh, so I don't uh, have a defense angle, but I will say uh, that pre people pay much more attention about resilience and about a redundancy availability of communication modes. Just like before pandemic, people say that our national health care system, the national health insurance system, is the pride of the nation. It really is. But people care a lot about waste. So people want to uh, use the budget very precisely, allocating exactly that many medical devices, that many nurses, that many doctors, uh, that many working hours, and so on. But when pandemic first hit Taiwan, this lack of reserve became a really big Problem because we don't have resilience when the case suddenly surged and so on. So we learned the hard reason, uh, the hard uh, lesson why to always keep a reserve, although it seems wasteful during the non-pandemic times, but it can mean a world of difference between uh, just catching up to the virus versus having some room to cope with the virus. Now, the same goes for communication, right? So people would say, oh, we already have point-to-point -point microwave connections or um, the fiber optics already works uh, on that particular indigenous nation and the rest can be done through Wi-Fi and so on. Uh, that may all be true or maybe one of the few telecoms already have service pointer, just switch uh, your phone to use that telecom or things like that, um, and which are all very cost effective, I'm sure. But after Ukraine, uh, people are starting to say, no, we actually want a low uh, uh, satellite that we may not use all the time, but as a comfort 
convertible backup. We want the possibility of roaming across all the telecom providers. Uh, if the war breaks out, we want to collect, connect to a nearby telecom tower. Uh, we want both wired and wireless connection in case one of them breaks and things like that. So a lot more emphasis on resilience not uh, cost effectiveness uh, is taking place right now um, in Taiwan. So uh, we, we think uh, that the Ukrainian people proved that in a democratic society with broadband access, uh, the collective intelligence can provide a very large advantage on the battlefield as well. So Kobayashi-san would like to know, how do you convince everyone about vaccination in Taiwan? Are those who are reluctant to have their children vaccinated also bullied in Taiwan? No, I, I do not think so, because we only check for the vaccination record on non-essential services, uh, adult entertainment, I'll just say it. So in, uh, so in restaurants and things like that, we don't check for vaccination status. There's no discrimination, uh, but in places where um, the entire reason to go there is to take off your masks. Uh, then uh, we do check for the vaccination records uh, because of counter pandemic reasons, but they're not uh, essential services and certainly not meant for children. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that just like the zero lockdown is important, um, zero coercion uh, for people to get vaccinated is also very important. And people who are reluctant to get vaccinated in Taiwan usually are only reluctant about specific brands. You can find people who don't want uh, AstraZeneca in the beginning. There's still a lot of people who say we don't want Medigen uh, at any uh, cost, right? And there are people who say I only want BNT or only want Moderna and so on. But that's fine because we have all four <laughs> in supply and people do get vaccinated. Uh, Kobayashi-san would like to know what measures are being taken to deal with the current rapid increase in the number of infected people that were still um, still around, uh, I think, a thousand people of um, mortality uh, in Taiwan, despite the rapid increase in the numbers. So we're adopting a New Zealand-like uh, model of coexistence of getting the 65-year-old or older people uh, once they are rapidly tested through antigen test without a PCR or anything, uh, just give them Paxlovid, uh, or if they prefer traditional uh, medicine, Qingguan Yihao, right, uh, and so on. So the idea is that uh, we need to have plenty of reserve of um, treatments of drugs and so on on that on one side, and also to increase vaccination, especially boosters uh, on the other side, and reserve the care uh, facilities uh, for people who will uh, probably suffer uh, from the COVID. Uh, but for the rest of us, we also make sure that people feel safe um, mentally uh, to offer the real-time services uh, through the real-time line-based uh, communication device, or just call 1922 and uh, listen to some someone with a lot of empathy uh, and things like that to uh, make sure that people do not panic, uh, even though that they got uh, contracted uh, in the cases. So I think those are mostly psychological measures, uh, but the uh, surehood of, for example, getting uh, your insurance money back and things like that, that are also very important, which is why we're working on the digital certificates of isolation and quarantine and confirmation of cases and so on. So Koichi Watanabe-san would like to know, please tell us about the future of relationship between the city center and the rural areas in the digital society. Well, I think the rural areas, uh, once we have broadband as a human right, will become nexus of culture, of people who feel similarly in a community. And the people who frequent those communities may not spend all their time there, but their heart, their mind is there, thanks to co-presence uh, technologies. Indeed, if you feel that you are in a certain place, even though you're physically in a different time zone, for example, it's far more likely that you will put your investments, your ingenuity, your innovations to service that particular community. So regional revitalization in Taiwan is based on the idea of social entrepreneurship. We don't have, like in Japan, designated strategic zones for regional revitalization. Uh, anyone who start a new idea is a strategic zone uh, around themselves, not necessarily a territorial one, uh, but rather a one uh, about, say, a time bank or Web3-based decentralized society or many indigenous 
indigenous uh, tribes uh, trying out new self-determination uh, ways on the um, not just voting, but also funding and things like that. All these are very important. So community, I believe, will take the center stage that links the stronger rural area um, um, uh, uniqueness and the connectivity of the city. So these two will feel like they are in the same community, not just imagined community, but really the same community. Uh, Ethan would like to know, do you think the Taiwan government will officially allow to use digital currency like Bitcoin in Taiwan? I don't think Bitcoin is banned in Taiwan. I think Bitcoin is entirely legal. Uh, it's just certain uses of Bitcoin, like, I don't know, funding terrorism or money laundering or uh, scams or things like that are illegal. But if you do that with new Taiwan dollar, it's also illegal. <laughs> so we're not discriminating <laughs> against Bitcoin. We're just saying that certain behaviors should be regulated by the uh, Financial Supervisory Council. I believe Japan is taking a very similar role uh, when it comes to the dangers of the digital currencies. Now, um, in Taiwan, we also uh, are considering the fiat, uh, the central bank uh, issuing their own digital currencies. But uh, just like cash, people have a certain privacy expectation. Like if I pay you in coins, in cash, the central bank doesn't really know that we are having this uh, transaction. But if we issue the CBDC, the kind of way some more authoritarian jurisdiction does that, then it breaks the norm about cash in the society. So, so how to protect the privacy in the transaction to ensure the security, not just from the black hat hackers, but also from the central bank. That need to be resolved before we can actually use digital currency as cash in Taiwan. Um, Ethan said, while using AI, we have to share our personal information to the system. How do we balance the risk for sharing personal information? Well, in a sense, uh, when I said I use the uh, citizen's digital certificate in my phone, I'm sharing my fingerprint with my phone. But the phone is not sharing it with anyone. It just used that fingerprint to unlock the phone, right? So the AI is purely assistive intelligence. It works only on my best interest and nobody else's. It's accountable to me and no one else. Um, so it's very important to see AI as a assistant, a assistive intelligence, not as an authoritarian intelligence that force you to, to give your fingerprint to the state or to anyone else. So keeping it personal, like personal computers. And within your community, maybe you trust each other to access in your family um, your medical records so that the elderly people can trust the young people to book vaccinations for them and so on. And that's all fine. But that is based on the mutual assistive relationship already existing in the family and in the community, not a superior authority to say, oh, you should trust that person, you should trust this person, right? So the norm-based community is always the first and foremost in assistive intelligence in the norm setting. And you should only trust people with data the same if you trust people with text, with information, uh, with your secrets and so on. There really should be no difference whether it's text or whether it's data. Uh, someone would like to ask, Dori Dori, do you think about the Japanese My Number card ID? Uh, I do think about that. I think that's the answer. Uh, well, I think um, Anonymous probably want to ask, well, how do I think about that? Why, uh, why does the Taiwanese people are comfortable with the IC-based uh, health insurance card, but not uh, equal amount of Japanese people feel comfortable with the My Number card? Well, uh, the thing is that since 2003, when we roll out the IC-based NHI card, till now, almost two decades, there's no cybersecurity incidents that decimates people's trust in the NHI system. The system is really good track record. Uh, and um, because it's almost two decades, people just gradually learned how to hold their uh, doctors, clinicians, or traditional medicine practitioners or dentists accountable because their record is also on the ledger. And people learn to use the virtualized NHI card through an app, a QR code based virtualized card based on the norm, trustworthy norm already there in the IC based card. But that took what? 16 years, right? So have patience, take time, and build trustworthiness through 
mutual accountability. Now, um, I think we're running out of time, uh, so I would like to just yeah, very quickly uh, remark that I really enjoy the questions, and sorry, I could not get to all the questions. Thank you. Time passed very fast. Thank you, Minister Audrey Tan, and everyone. We can understand that digital technology can solve many issues in our society and inspire our intuitive ability. We hope that each of us will contribute to society both in Taiwan and in Japan and in the world together. Thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Thank this you. is the uh, chairman of the Department of Business Administration. I represent the National Zhongzheng University. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tang. Tang Feng Xian, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Live long and prosper. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.